here we have a new piano. <clears throat> I'm very happy to say that it works very well. You know, it's all, <clears throat> it's, we, we are exploring a world in which Chopin arrives in Paris the end of 1831 and immediately goes to the workshop of Pleyel and then writes a letter to Titus Wojciechowski, Pleyel is known plus ultra. And that is a kind of a challenge <clears throat> to a piano builder to make something uh, for which nothing is better. Nothing is better than ultra. <laughs> Forgive my Latin, <clears throat> but you understand he really nothing was better than the play L that he's writing to his friend. And they, they both understand pianos. They talk about pianos, Titus Wojciechowski and Frederick Chopin. They each own Buchholz pianos in Warsaw and Chopin writes about the pleasing touch and alluring sound of the Buchholz. And so they're kind of intimate on this. They're comparing each other's new toys, basically. They're children together. Uh, <clears throat> and immediately he writes about this, a very similar piano. This is 1830. The hammers are leather. <clears throat> and, well, what can we say? The proportions are still a light touch and a transparent sound. <clears throat> but if you look at the tail of this piano, it's getting wider than you will see on a Viennese piano of this period. It's just that there's a, a width in the bass, which is not just an analogy, it is an acoustic effect where you have more room for the bass. And that becomes a prominent feature in the development of the romantic piano. You're putting the piano, you're putting the bridge out in the middle of an ocean is what you're doing. And you're making the possibility of long, slow waves of movement possible in such a wider structure. Uh, and you can carry this concept further to the modern piano and the crossover stringing. It has that concept of sticking the bass in the middle of an ocean. So you have this kind of infinite sound in the bass, which this piano does quite well. Uh, and it is that, that body of support in the sound which is going to be the French piano, which is astonishingly <clears throat> Uh, kind of a, a different palette of sound possibility for Chopin and how exciting that is. <clears throat> uh, and then, of course, you recognize that his music changes, his concept of writing, what are the effects he creates. Yeah, who knows why, how much the, <clears throat> the, roman the, the world of revolution in Paris 1830 and the world of revolution in Warsaw in 1830, 31, when he's writing a revolutionary etude in Stuttgart, a bit miserable, you know, before he gets to Paris. <clears throat> and there I can imagine, let me just, uh, I'm no musicologist, but I can imagine that the world of this romantic, uh, dream world of another life other than the horror on the streets. I, I think the, 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 the life of the poetic individual is described in this music coming from this man in a world where somebody wanted to be far away, I can imagine. Uh, <clears throat> well, that's another, that's not musicology. That's just some kind of an impression, but I feel that this Type of piano sound is for a kind type of music exactly for this period. And that's what we do when we talk about historical pianos. We talk about their place in the culture at the moment. So that, that's <clears throat> my perspective on this. And I, I hope we have given a, a, a reasonable, a, a good recognizable example of that period tone and concept and kind of 
world of hope. Uh, and, you know, there's a world of illusion and disillusion in, uh, expressed by someone like Chopin. And then you need a piano like this.